Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Annie. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Annie. Hi, Annie. I started coming to this meeting a couple of months ago, and I've been really, really loving it. And um, I love that we have business meetings here, and um, the regular group members who come here are really kind and welcoming, even to me, so I really <laughs> have appreciated that. Um, and I'm really... Uh, happy and grateful to have gotten to be sober for the past 11 years. Um, the last 11 years I spent in AA, and um, I can explain what that means after I tell you about what it was like for me. Um, I spent it like thoroughly in AA, so much in AA that I married someone in AA, and he asked me to speak tonight. Thank you, Miles. <laughs> this is my sponsor, Karen, and uh, I'm really, I came here to hear her tonight. I'm really excited about that. Um, I, I'm 39 years old. I started drinking when I was 13, and um, there's something that happened for me when I picked up the first drink, which is that I just felt like I found something that um, was supposed to be in my body, like, all along, and um, something very, like, familiar, and I already didn't like my family at that time, so there was something, like, I had come home, and it was not the easiest thing to find uh, ways to drink because I was very young and I had to, you know, like tell a lot of lies to be able to drink. Um, and I just learned how to lie really well. And my parents also were like, I would come home like really drunk and they, and I'd be like, what? you know, just staring at the TV being weird. And it's like, they just preferred, I just think they would just always prefer to be like, everything's okay. Everything's okay. Everything's okay. With this like crazy lady, looking at the, you know, TV all weird, and they're just, I don't, I don't know if they noticed, but they, uh, certainly didn't know how to deal with me, and, um, so, I just, you know, like, I just, I just felt normal, actually, when I, like, started drinking, I just felt normal, and I, I thought that, like, I really thought for the longest time that it was really fun, and that, like, it didn't occur to me that I couldn't stop. Like, I just didn't think I wanted to. Like, I just was like, this is what I do. And, you know, I lived in New Hampshire. And um, later, I, I went to school in Penn State. And so, there, like, there's certainly not Uber at that time, okay? And there's <laughs> certainly not even cabs. You know, you weren't hailing cabs, so you, you drank and drove. And that wasn't even a thought to me. I started drinking and driving when I was in high school. And um, if you think, like, I don't know if anyone's been in New Hampshire, like, really windy roads, and you're in the woods, and it is dark. And, you know, just tequila, 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 and just, like, just get, because I went, who would I call? You know, I had to maintain, if I maintained the lie, I would continue to drink. And protecting drinking was what I needed to do, you know, because that that meant to me, it meant that I could, like, be okay. And even after I got a DUI, um, it was because, like, it wasn't because I was drunk. It was for so many other reasons. And so progressively over time, I even moved to San Francisco, and I said, like, I had these crazy drunk friends, and they were, like, for sure alcoholics, you know? And I didn't even know what that word meant, but for sure and I just knew I had no shot if I was around them. And I was living in Providence, Rhode Island, and I just felt like it just wasn't big enough for me. And so I just ha I just assumed that when I, you know, showed up in San Francisco, I my life would come together, you know, and like everything would work out and I would I would meet 
somebody who I would uh, marry and everything, like, happily ever after. And just sort of the opposite happened, and it progressively kept getting worse. And my – it's almost like the quantity is so interesting. So alcoholism isn't necessarily defined by um, quantity, right? Because over time, I actually started drinking less, except that the impact to me kept getting greater. So I could drink like a glass or two of wine and black out, you know, and, and I wasn't drinking just a glass or two of wine. Like I call it a glass or two, but like I was buying large enough glasses. So I could, just one tonight, Annie, you know, and, like, and so I, w- I was largely, I had, you know, I, I did have, um, I, I turned to drugs at times because it would help me drink more and it would help me not black out. And um, that was one method that I tried. And just over time, that combination just wasn't working either. And it got to a point where um, I just tried, I just tried so many methods. And I just swore I was so, like, I couldn't understand it because I was just so smart. You know, like, my mom brought me up to be, like, just such a, a smart, independent woman. And I just, I just tried, you know, like acupuncture and diets and exercise and aerobics instructor and juicing and the master cleanse and psychic classes and just whatever meditation and prayer and weed, you know, like how can I just, can I, how can I, and it just got to a point where, you know, the guy, the guy who I slept with shook my hand on Market Street and I was like, I, I was like, I'm not going to do this again. And I did it again. Dude shook my hand. And at that moment, there was a divine thought that I was like, it was very true. And for the first time, I heard something true. And I don't know why I knew it was true. But it that voice in my soul said, it's the, it's the alcohol. And when I came to AA, um, like I was sort of pushed to AA by something greater than me. I learned, uh, I got a sponsor almost immediately because I was, um, I just, everyone here had clear skin and like bright eyes and just felt like there was a light shining down on everyone. And like, just every, everyone looked like they had it together. I don't think everyone did, but compared to me, I mean, everyone did. And, um, I heard the message I heard was get a sponsor. And so I got a sponsor and when I started working the sex with a sponsor, she told me that an alcoholic, um, once they have one drink, a couple of drinks, they're not going to be able to stop, you know? And then an alcoholic, you know, believes that insanely trivial excuse that like, I, I'm going to figure out how to drink this time. And those two things, like I knew for sure, you know, like I could not, like, I just, I had a sense of craving when I started drinking and it was, it was physical. And no, I can, I can still remember that. I can still feel it. Like I remember that feeling and I just tried so hard to figure it out. And I knew that was the insanely ex- trivial excuse because I like messed up every night. And I said, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this. Wake up in the morning. And I'm like, Oh, I did it again. Uh, you know, I'm never going to drink again. An hour or two goes by and it's like, well, you know, I, I just didn't eat enough starch last night. <laughs> Maybe I just didn't have enough vitamins. So I've, I've worked the steps. I've had a couple of sponsors and I've, um, thank you. I, uh, I really love, I really love being sober because, and, and I don't know why we don't talk about this that much, but like it's, there's a, a beautiful evolution of sobriety over a really long period of time. And that's like the most important thing in my life. You know, my, relationship to AA and my relationship to God and, um, obviously my other relationships too, you know, and, um, three years ago I started working with, with my, my current sponsor and she just, it was like, she showed me the steps in a way that I had never like been taught the steps and they were like the purest, most authentic thing, you know, that I had ever been shown. And, and then she showed she, she, we went through the traditions together and then we went through the concepts together. And it was at that point, I literally was like, and one of the first things Karen said to me, she's like, Annie, 
what's your 12th step? And I was like, I have like six or seven sponsees, you know, I've got this. I've been doing 12 step for a long time, got group commitments. And she goes, well, what are you doing for AA as a whole? And I was like so embarrassed because I had so much ego when I said that to her. <laughs> and I, like about a month later, I became a GSR and I really felt like I joined the movement of AA, you know, and I was in a group for five years and it was like, all of a sudden AA opened up to me and I opened up to AA, you know, and, you know, since then I just felt like a part of this, we have this massive movement here, like it internationally been to meetings all over the world. And we really like, I can't believe, like I have like two things, two of the most important two things in my life in common with everyone here and no matter where I go, which is that I'm an alcoholic with those those two things that we all have in common, you know, the craving and the, the insanity and, and that today, uh, you know, we're all sober and, and through Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, and, and, uh, what a beautiful thing, like to turn a shit life into usefulness. I mean, who knew that, 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 crappy life where I woke up wanting to die every day and be like, how am I going to kill myself today? Like it actually turned into usefulness for, for other alcoholics. I mean, such, I, I mean, I owe AA for that. So, um, that's it. Thanks. Hi everybody. My name is Karen and I'm an alcoholic. Hi Karen. And, um, I want to thank Miles for asking me to share. Um, it's great to be here tonight. It's great to be here tonight sober. It's great to be any place sober. And thank you, Annie, for your share. It was wonderful. This is a kind of, we were talking on the way in, you know, that the blessings that we get in Alcoholics Anonymous, these relationships that we get to have, and what is it? It's just a result of being bad actors out there, right? Mm -hmm. I was like running and jumping and causing trouble and causing pain to people. And as a result of that, I get to come in here and be with you guys, who are the people I've always loved most in the world. Anyway, I knew how to spot you from afar. I always knew how to find the alcoholics, whether it was in high school or college or at work or wherever I went. I knew how to find you guys, and I always liked you guys better than everybody else. And now I get to be with you all the time, and the only dr difference is that today we're all trying not to drink one day at a time. So um, welcome to the newcomers. I'm really glad that you're here. And um, this may not sound nice, but I hope you've been pretty miserable in the last few months. <laughs> Because at least miserable enough to make you willing to go to any lengths. And when I think of the lengths that I went to when I was drinking, that's not really a big ask. You know, what we ask of you in Alcoholics Anonymous, compared to the running and jumping that I did when I was out there, nothing. Piece of cake. So, um, you know, Miles tried to brief me a little bit, and so he explained to me that I'm supposed to, like, talk all the time about what it was like, right? And drop the F-bomb all over the place. <laughs> no, he was so cute. <laughs> anyway, so, but I love that. You know, I find it very touching and wonderful that a meeting cares enough about the fifth tradition and carrying the message to the alcoholic who's confined, I mean, who is, wow, here comes my H&I, &I, to the alcoholic who still suffers, that you set some guidelines like that. You care that, you know, we do the best job that we can to carry the message to the alcoholic, and that's important to me. So, you know, I can kind of tell you all about me in a few sentences, really. First of all, I'm a real alcoholic. It used to drive me crazy when people would say that. But what it means is, you know what? I'm not just a heavy drinker. I am not classified as a heavy drinker, although I was a heavy drinker. But the difference between me and a heavy drinker is heavy drinkers are able to stop drinking if a sufficient reason comes up for them to do it. But for me, no matter how strong the motivation and how good the 
the reason I had no ability to control when I was going to start drinking. And once I started drinking, I had no ability to control how long I was going to continue drinking. And that lack of control is what distinguishes me from a heavy drinker. Um, I, I know that I have a condition that is progressive and hopeless and fatal. And it's progressive because, like we read in, uh, you know, more about alcoholism, over any given period of time, it got worse, never better. And there were times when I would, so over a big period of time, so there were times when I would manage it a little bit. But I don't know if any of you have ever, like, seen a graph of a stock that's getting ready to tank or that's tanking. Uh But it kind of goes down, and then maybe it comes up a little bit, and then it goes down, further down than it was before. And then it comes up a little bit, and then it really goes down. Well, in the beautiful parlance of stock trading, they call those things when it goes up, that's called a dead cat bounce. <laughs> and that's what it was like for me. For a little period of time, I could get it together, and it looked like there was still some life left in me. But inevitably, I would go down even further than I was before. So progressive, hopeless, I tried everything that I could, and deadly. I was damaging my liver. I was damaging my stomach. I was damaging my brain, and I could have died from it very easily. I OD'd a couple of times. But even worse than that, it was fatal to others because I drove drunk a lot of times. And I could have I could have killed anybody. I could have maimed anybody. So definitely progressive, hopeless, and fatal. And the true nature of my condition, you know, is that There is something physically and mentally different about me. And it's mentally different about me because it's physically different about me. Alcohol reacts differently in my body than it does in a normal person's. This is really not... I was so glad when I came in and read the doctor's opinion and found out that this wasn't a moral failing that I had. I have a body that responds differently from normal people's. And when you put the chemical alcohol into it, it's like pinball machine. Everything starts binging and banging, and it feels so great. And when something feels that good, of course you're going to become obsessed with it. You're going to start craving it because it feels so good. I secretly think that, like, normal people don't get as high as we do. You know, it's just like if they, because if they felt as good when they drank as I did, they would have drank like me, you know? So anyway, I have this physical condition that's very different, and I don't really buy into the whole thing of, like, you know, in AA, sometimes things go viral when they really shouldn't. (laughs) And for a while, at least over in San Francisco, I was hearing these people say, I'm not, uh, I'm not all effed up because I'm a drunk. I'm a drunk because I'm all effed up, right? And I thought that shows a remarkable misunderstanding of the true nature of our condition, right? (laughs) That is not what it is at all. I know plenty of people who are as self-centered and fearful and spiritually sick as anybody in this room, and I bet you do too. But they're not alcoholics, right? They just go on being that way. They don't have the thing that makes me the alcoholic. Alcohol just does not do for them what it does for me. So, and you know, the bad thing about that kind of thinking too is the corollary is if I just drank because I was all screwed up, then if I can stop being screwed up, I'll be able to drink okay again, right? It'd be okay if I take a drink because I'm no longer all screwed up and insecure and self-centered and things like that. And that's a very dangerous thought, because I'll tell you, no matter how spiritually fit I become, I will never be able to safely take a drink. I could be like Mother Teresa, Mahatma Gandhi, and sweet baby Jesus all rolled up into one. 
And if I took a drink, all bets are off, right? Because once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. So, you know, and AA was the only thing that ever worked for me. I tried every single method I could think of, and I'm a very self-willed gal, and he knows that. So, and I tried everything, and AA, this beautiful paradox of Alcoholics Anonymous, was that through working the steps, I was able to find a power greater than myself, which has allowed me not to take a drink one day at a time since March of 1987. And not only that, but it has enabled me to live happily and usefully whole. And that's this beautiful little thing from our 12 and 12, the introduction to the 12 and 12 system. Happily and usefully whole, that's some pretty good stuff, right? I mean, that's a wonderful reward for what we get. So basically, that, you know, that's really all I need to tell you guys. I got, like, what, 30 minutes more. <laughs> so I'll have to fill it out a little bit, and I'll tell you some of my experiences with alcohol so you can identify and how I practice a spiritual program of recovery. But you guys know the end of the story. The end of the story is that Alcoholics Anonymous got me sober in 1987, and it, one day at a time, has kept me sober ever since. So, anyway, uh, I got drunk for the first time when I was 10 years old, and I remember it really, really clearly. Now, not all alcoholics remember their first drunk, but I did. And we were at a big Christmas celebration, and I was with my parents, and they were passing, or they would have, they'd bring in, it was in Germany, so they'd bring in a different course for dinner, and it was a, Christmas Eve celebration. So it's all this big thing, and they make a big deal of it in Germany. And they'd bring in a course, and they'd bring in a bottle of wine with it. And because it was in Europe, kids drink in Europe. So they'd pour a little wine into my glass and think, ah, that won't hurt her. And then they'd bring in another course. And after about six or seven courses, man, I was three sheets to the wind. And I remember just looking around and the glow in the room and that wonderful, warm feeling that I had. And apparently, because my parents used to tell me the story, I said, like, this is the most beautiful place in the world, and you're the most wonderful parents that ever lived, and when I grow up, I'm going to come back here and get married, and all that, like, you know, nonsense, that drunk nonsense started right away for me. And it was that feeling of their world was full of possibilities, that I could have anything, do anything, and be anything I wanted. And who wouldn't chase that feeling for the next 30 years, right? That's a great feeling. I didn't become an active drunk at the age of 10, but, <laughs> but I was, you know, I, I, as a teenager, I started having blackouts. And, you know, for anybody who's wondering, that's a pretty surefire sign that you're an alcoholic. Non-alcoholics don't have blackouts. And, you know, I thought my friends were lying. You know, I thought, uh, because here's the thing, I knew better than to do some of the things that they told me I'd done. I knew better. I, was, I wasn't brought up by wolves, you know? <laughs> and, and, and yet, uh, I thought they must be lying to get some sort of a, like, moral leverage on me or something like that, right? I'm sure it was all true and more. And then, and then I would come to in these like morally ambiguous circumstances and not know how I got there. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that is, that started as a teenager. And also as a teenager, I got too smart for God. If you were some soft sister and you needed a little something to depend on, well, you know, go ahead, have your God, you little weakling. But, if you're a tough cookie and a smart cookie like I thought I was, I didn't need to depend on anything. And all of that stuff was just nonsense, irrelevant nonsense to me. And I was like, believe that for the next, you know, till I got sober. Uh, so, so, you know, that's what I was like. Uh, a couple of examples of the insanity of alcohol. You know, I had been um, 
arrested for one of my many DUIs. And this is back in the day. You could get a lot of DUIs back then, you know. And uh, they sentenced me. I don't know if you guys have heard this story, right? I don't know. Uh, the Cow Palace story. <laughs> <laughs> they sentenced me to go to a DUI class, and it was held at the Cow Palace, which is, if anybody's ever been there, it's a huge thing in San Francisco. And I drive into the parking lot, and I see all these cones set up, and I walk into the room, and it's a huge room, like twice as big as this. And there's a big table with all different kinds of alcohol set up on it. And we sit down, and the instructor starts explaining that they're going to take two volunteers from the audience, a male and a female. You see it coming, don't you? <laughs> because, uh, a male and a female. We get to choose whatever alcohol we want. They're going to give us a drink every 20 minutes, and we drive around the course, and the rest of the class gets to observe how our reactions change. Now, I don't know how they got away with it. They'd be sued silly today, right? <laughs> but, so, they asked for the female volunteer, and i got to tell you, my hand went flying up so fast, I practically dislocated my shoulder, right? And he picks, and he points at me, and he goes, you. And so I turn around to gloat at all the people that, you know, hadn't been picked, but nobody else even had raised their hand. <laughs> so you guys clearly were not in the room that day. Anyway, so they picked the male volunteer, and in the beginning, it's going great. Because I'm like, you know, I know how to do this. This is driving drunk, it's my thing, right? I know how to do it with one eye closed, and I've had a lot of practice, and this, and I was beating the guy. That was that was so good. I was like doing better, and then all of a sudden the memories get very blurry. I remember like cones flying through the air. <laughs> I I had this vision of traveling backwards instead of forwards. Crowd scattering. <laughs> Long story short, I end up going home and spending the night with the male drunk volunteer. <laughs> waking up the next morning and not having the faintest idea where I am. I mean, talk about incomprehensible demoralization. It was like the bed was on the floor and there were dirty clothes. The guy was clearly not acquainted with the concept of hygiene. I could hear like weird voices in the other room. And that would not have been the first time that I ended up in a situation like that. But this time I didn't have my car because, you know, they didn't let me drive home. So or, or to wherever I was, I didn't know what town I was in. I didn't know how to get out of there. This was before cell phones. And it was like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? This is like this horrible, crazy situation. And you know what? To this day, I don't remember how I got home. I did get home, and eventually I got my car, but I don't remember how that happened. That's the kind of insanity that results from what my behavior was like. Some of the not-so-funny things were like waking up in some dingy SRO with a cool, stranger that I just met and realizing he had a gun under the pillow, <laughs> thinking... That's not so good. And not knowing how to get out of there. But, you know, I lost I lost jobs. I lost friends. I lost boyfriends. I lost things. I, I lost several cars, actually, <laughs> through drinking. But, you know, I lost so much of this stuff just because that was the only way I knew how to drink. It was like full tilt boogie. Just party on, take it to the max. My alcoholism was such that by the time I was ready to get sober, I was addicted to every substance available out on the streets. But I'll tell you what, it's very difficult to deny that you're an addict when you're standing in line at the methadone clinic, right? Six o'clock in the morning, you're standing there with a bunch of other runny-nosed lowlifes, and it's kind of like, yeah, guess I'm an addict, right? But alcohol, cunning, baffling, powerful. And that's why I think, you know, our singleness of purpose is so important. Alcohol was the thing that I always thought was my buddy. That was my friend. 
And when I'd go into these different places for like this and that and the other thing, they'd say, check off the substances that you have problems with. They check off everything but alcohol because you weren't taking my alcohol away from me, right? Alcohol is really the subtle foe. And I realized alcohol was the continuous thread throughout my life. And I would get one thing out of my life, but still there was alcohol. And then I'd get the next substance out of my life, and still there was alcohol. And by the end, you know what? I just, my life was just disappointing and hurting people who loved me. So many people really loved me. I'm not an alcoholic because people didn't love me because I was some unloved little girl, you know? I was loved, and I just was a disrespectful daughter. I was an unfaithful girlfriend. I was a dishonest employee, you know? And the worst thing of all is I was a bad mother. And I'll tell you, I had a son when I was quite young, and that was the one thing that I said, this is the most important thing in the world to me. This is the one thing that I care about doing right. Guys in and out of my life, I don't care. Different jobs, I don't care. I moved all over the country, but I always said the one thing that I will not let my drinking interfere with is my relationship with my son. And I wish I could tell you that the first time I saw that look in his eyes, that was like, oh, God, mom is drunk, was my wake-up call. Because I've heard people say that. But i got to tell you guys, I saw that look in his eyes many, many times. And every time I would say to myself, this will never happen to me again. I will never let, I will never make him look at me and see what a drunk I am. And maybe it wouldn't happen for a month or a week, but eventually it would always happen. And I know if I pick up one drink today, I'll be right back to that place. And it's so important for me to remember today that not only does alcohol have the power to take away the jobs and the boyfriends and the clothes and all that kind of stuff, alcohol has the power to take away the one thing that I think is the most important thing in my life, the one thing that I truly love and care about, and alcohol can take that away from me just like that. So that's a good reminder for me. So anyway, you know what happened? What happened was that I just ran out of options. I came home one morning, and I was feeling that, again, incomprehensible demoralization. And my sister happened to call, and she said, how you doing? And I had a moment of clarity. Annie talked about kind of her moment of clarity, too. And I was sitting there dejected, and it was dark, and I kind of got this realization. For the first time, I saw clearly, I can either have the life that I thought I was always going to have, that I always assumed, you know, good friends, loving relationships, responsible, productive member of society, or I could drink the way I wanted to drink. But I realized in that moment that I probably couldn't do both, that I had to make a choice. And my sister called, and she said, how you doing? And I said for the first time in my life that I honestly remember, I need help. I, don't, I said, I don't know what's going on. I have tried to do everything I can. And, I, and, and it's alcohol has kicked my ass, and I don't know what to do, and I need help. And I've heard over and over again in these rooms that when we finally get to the point where we can say, I need help, this was my little sister, for God's sake, right, that that's when things start to change. And that's when things started to change for me. And I got help, and I got into a treatment program, and it was what I call a good, humble treatment program. And by that I mean they didn't try to be my higher power. They said, we can teach you about alcoholism, we can help you get sober, but we can't keep you sober. If you want to stay sober over for a long, any decent period of time, you got to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. And thank God alcohol kicked my ass so badly that I was willing to do that. And I came to this meeting. And like I said, not this meeting, but, you know, I went to Alcoholics Anonymous. And like I said, I sensed right away that I was in the right place because I've always known how to find you guys. And here you were. And the only difference is 
you're living a spiritual life and trying to stay sober and helping each other do that one day at a time. But you're still the crazy, wonderful people I've always loved to hang around with. So that was good. And because alcohol kicked my ass, I was willing to go to any lengths. So when you said get a sponsor, I thought, <laughs> gross idea, but I did it anyway. And it turned out to be like one of the best decisions I've ever made in Alcoholics Anonymous. Because I'll tell you, this thing, these families of sponsorship that we get to have, truly amazing. You know, there is no motive in there except I get to stay sober and you get to stay sober. And I don't believe that nonsense about it doesn't make any difference if they stay sober or not. At least I stayed sober. That's the same old self-centered way of thinking that I used to think. It does matter. And I take care. And I try to be responsible for my relationship with the women that I work with because I want us both to be sober. And I think God wants us to be sober. I think God wants, every, I don't think God chose me to come into these rooms and get sober. I think God wants every alcoholic of my type to be sober. Not only that we don't, it's so that we don't keep harming the rest of the world, but I think, you know, the loving God that I understand doesn't cherry pick and choose people and say, oh, you're going to get sober, but I'm going to let Susie suffer in the gutter and die a miserable alcoholic death. God wants us all to be sober, and it's just a question for me of how much survival instinct that I have to come in here and listen to you guys and be willing to follow directions. So, so got the sponsor, worked the steps, uh, learned the principles. How am I doing on time? Okay. Yeah, yeah. you got like 12 hours. Okay, so I learned the principles of the program. And you know, the secret sauce of Alcoholics Anonymous is like two things were happening there. Dr. Silkworth and science had progressed enough, so they were really starting to understand the physical nature of alcoholism. At the same time, there's this Oxford groups movement going on that was spiritual in nature. I mean, certainly... We know Alcoholics Anonymous isn't the first. And they had these principles that they were living by. And they would try to get people sober, but it wasn't working for them. And it wasn't until, you know, Dr. Silkworth finally said to, Bob, to, to Bill, before he went to go visit Bob, he said, stop with all this preachy nonsense. Let him know he's hopeless. Let him know the exact physical condition that he's in. And then maybe he'll decide, because Bob knew more about spiritual principles than Bill did. Bob had been going to Oxford groups and been trying to do it. But the principles that they passed down to us are six simple principles. And it's the principle of utter surrender of personal powerlessness. Turning it over and adopting a power greater than ourselves, which will help us do what we can't do on our own human unaided will. Practicing self-examination, confessing our faults to another human being, making restitution for harms done, and being of service to others. And those are six principles, and Bill goes when he's writing the steps there in his house. He goes, yeah, but alcoholics, they're always looking for loopholes. So we better take these six principles and spread them out to 12 different steps. That's how we got the 12 steps, because he fleshed them out a little bit. He knew that without talking about, you know, <clears throat> getting a little more precise on character defects and things like that, things could slip through the cracks. So anyway, that's what I learned as the new way of life. Steps one through nine were me learning the new way of life, and that's what happened. And because that happened, I've been able to stay sober since then. And today I practice 10, 11, and 12, and I'm going to end with those steps, which are the maintenance steps, and also service. But I want to say first, that son that I love more than anything, who couldn't even really bear to look at his mom and could refuse to come home and see me, he's now an active part of my life today as a direct result of alcohol and synonymous. As a direct result of this, when he had his newborn babies, I was the first person he handed his newborn kids to. Because he knew he could trust me today. 
Alcoholics Anonymous has changed my life like that. That's just one example of the healing that comes from Alcoholics Anonymous and these principles that we practice. But, and you know, it, I, it makes me uncomfortable when people distill the 12 beautiful steps and basically the six principles down into these pithy little words. Because they're really principles of action. So, you know, I, I heard somebody go, oh, well, the principle of the fourth step is courage. I'm like, I don't think so. Really? No. You know what? I could go into a burning building to rescue a kitty, right? I'd have all the courage you want. But unless I'm practicing self-examination, I'm not practicing the principle of the fourth step. So that's what, you know, 10, 11, and 12 keep me on that beam. They keep me practicing that self-examination. They keep me admitting my wrongs when I talking to other people. They keep me looking at the character defects as new ones come up. They keep me in meditation. And I'll tell you what, a lot, step 11 in meditation, I've had sponsors, and this sounds kind of like not what you hear all the time, um, but for me, in this case, quantity is better than quality. And I've had sponsors come to me and go, oh, I'm trying to meditate for 30 minutes in the morning, and I'm trying to da 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 And I'm like, you know what? My experience is this. The more often I make a connection with God, any time during the day, the better my day is. I can meditate for 20 minutes in the morning, get off my knees or whatever lotus position I'm in, and I'm the same old Karen the rest of the 24 hours. But if I am constantly trying to make that connection with God, and God is like my, you know, imaginary friend. So I talk to God, and I'm like, well, God, what do you think about this? How's this going? What should we do about this? What's going on with that? And the more often I do that, the closer I feel like I can be able to do God's will instead of my own will. And that's a nice little, that's a good, great tool to have. And just ending with service, you know, Annie talked about it, and it's so important to me that, um, you know, sometimes if you hear people talking about what's wrong with AA, and I always say, you know what, that's, that's our fault. Us sponsors, you know, if we think that our job is just to take our sponsees through the first 12 steps, we're only doing part of our job. Because really, we're a member of a fellowship that I will never be able to repay my debt to. There's no way I can repay Alcoholics Anonymous for having saved my life and given me a life, right? So... <clears throat> So, you know, we get to step 12, and they go, I, are we done? I'm like, oh, not even close. <laughs> Read tradition one. And then we study the traditions together. And then we get to, to tradition 12, and they go, are we done yet? I'm like, well, we're more than halfway there. <laughs> and then we start to read the concepts together. And after that, like, Annie are, and I are we're on this journey of reading A, It Comes of Age, and there's so much stuff, there's so much AA stuff to absorb, and that's just rich in the history and everything else. But what I found is that this, these character defects that, that I got to identify and get to identify on a continuous basis are kind of, I have a unique mix of assets and defects. I'm not unique as an alcoholic. I'm the same as every other damn alcoholic, right? But as a human being, I am unique. I have this particular mix of assets and defects. And what I've found is that for every mix that's in here, there's a service commitment that's right for you. There is something that will work for you. And just keep trying until you find it. And it doesn't matter if it's general service or it's, you know, something with central office and IFB. I have a lot of sponsees, and they do uh, teleservice. So for me, you know, the idea of getting called in the middle of the night by a drunk is like, let's <laughs> just poke me in the eye and call it even, right? <laughs> but they love it. They, you know, they love doing that. 
So something works for everyone. What's worked for me is H&I, which is where we carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous to alcoholics who are confined. And that's what works for me, and I am honored to serve as the general chair of the committee for Northern California. If anybody is interested in getting an H&I commitment, there are always more than enough openings to go around. And it's such a simple, clean way to carry the message. You know, you just go into a facility, you drop off the message, and you walk out. You may never see that person again, but you've dropped, you've left them the message to do with what they want. So, so, but whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Just find it and run with it. Because the gift that Alcoholics Anonymous has given me too is not only do I have a loving son back in my life, not only do I have these relationships with other alcoholics where we're all growing spiritually and emotionally and and, and I'm blessed to have so many sponsees and things like that. But today I really have a purpose in life. You know, purpose in life is very important. I used to think I wanted fame and money and all those good things. And I realized that waking up every morning and knowing that I have a purpose in life, it's like, it's just rocks beyond belief, you know? And it's, there's never a question in my mind that there's something that God wants me to do today. So I'll just close to the newcomers. Um, You know, it says in the forward to the second tradition when it's talking about why we tell our stories and why the stories are in in the big book and stuff like that. And they say, you know, we hope that maybe you will say during the course of my story, oh, I've done that. And more than that, we kind of hope you may say, oh, yeah, I felt like that. But most of all, the hope is that you're sitting there going, jeez, if she can do it, I could do it. And I hope that it's worth doing and that you think it's worth doing because believe me, it is. It's full of gifts that you just would not believe are there for you. So thank you very much for helping me stay sober tonight. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.